Uh, I just want to start by saying a very big thank you to everyone in this room. Um, you guys have stuck there with us uh, through thick and thin uh, last few cycles. Thank you, Mr. President, for all the work uh, that you have done for our races. And we are uh, our number one priority, I'll tell you today, elect John Oseguera in Nevada 3. We're going to get him in Congress. He's going to be here to fight for you guys, fight for working families, uh, and fight uh, for our caucus. Um, oh, it's up on this. Okay, there we go. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> Got to get oriented here. All right. I'm going to go uh, very quickly because I know you guys have a lot to do today. Um, oh, here we go. I first wanted to walk through some of the math uh, that Congressman Israel talked about uh, in terms of how we take back the House. As he said, we only need 25 seats to win back the majority. We lost 63 last cycle. It was a devastating loss. But to win back the majority, we only need 25 seats. Let me walk you through two ways that we get there with the math. As the Congressman mentioned, there are 18 seats that John Kerry won, John Kerry won in his presidential race that are currently controlled by a Republican. We think we can win two thirds of those. We're not gonna win them all, but conservatively, we think we can win two thirds. Uh, that gets us 12 seats. Then there are 45, this is a big number, I was surprised when I learned it, 45 seats that Obama uh, one that are currently controlled by a Republican. We think it will at least win a third of those. That gets us right there to 27 seats. That's how we take back the majority. Now, some people ask me sometimes, you have some incumbents who are vulnerable, and we do. Uh, and people say, well, okay, fine, so this math is nice and everything, but then when you lose some incumbents, how are you gonna get to your 25? Let me show you a different way of looking at this. If we take the Obama districts and put them into different categories, the strong Obama districts, these are the places where Obama got more than 55% of the vote, and then what we call the middle Obama districts is where Obama got 48 to 50% of the vote, and then there's the low Obama districts, I don't even have those on here. If we win all of our strong Obama districts, which I think every lead prognosticator, everybody in the press believes we absolutely can do, that gets us 182 seats, okay? From there, if you look at these middle Obama districts, there are seven of them that are currently held by a Democrat. We win all those, okay? Six of those seats are open. There's no, uh, they're, they're either somebody retired or it's a brand new seat created by redistricting. We win 60% of those, that gets us four. And then the remaining 63 seats where Obama got between 48 and 54%, if we win only 40% of those, that gets us 25, that gets us to a majority of 218. What's not on here right now is there are eight uh, incumbent Democrats, so they're serving in Congress now, running for reelection, that are not on this screen. I'm not saying I wanna lose those seats, we're gonna fight but we can actually afford to lose, in this scenario, up to eight Democratic seats that we currently control, okay? And that doesn't even include the open, so Democrats who've retired, they're not even on this. I can lose eight people who are currently serving and still get to our majority. So we feel very confident that the math is there for us to win. Let's talk very quickly through redistricting. A lot of people ask me about this. I'm sure this is, you know, a lot of you live through this in your states. There are three different kinds of states in redistricting. States that gained seats, states that lost seats, and states where the lines were dramatically redrawn. So let me go through these very quickly. Um, the first thing I'll say is redistricting was a wash, an absolute wash. When you look at when districts moved from one state to another, we lost some, they lost some, we gained some, uh, uh, they gained some. If you look at this chart right here, in states that gained seats, Nevada is one of those. John Oseguer is running in a new seat there. We gained six, six safe Democratic seats. Republicans gained five, and Arizona is a toss-up. That could go either way. We feel optimistic about our chances there, but let's be fair, it could go either way. Um, in the states that lost seats, again, a wash. We, you know, the Republicans will point to uh, Massachusetts, Ohio, uh, excuse me, Ohio, Pennsylvania, all these seats. Yes, they lost seats. Uh, we did lose seats there, but the Republicans lost them too. Even in states where they're in control of the process, Iowa, uh, Louisiana, Ohio, um, they, because of the, the population changes, they had to lose seats there as well. So gaining and losing seats, a wash, okay? Um, the next piece is where the lines were redrawn dramatically, and let's take a little bit of time on this because it's important. Uh, in California, uh, in Florida, 
pretty uh, uh, dramatically new laws were passed that dictated how redistricting is done. It had to be a fairer process. Uh, in California, it was a citizen commission. In Florida, it's a new set of rules about how those districts need to be drawn. This is the secret weapon we have in terms of taking back the majority. So all the other redistricting was a wash, but we, we are making huge gains in California, Florida, and then Illinois, where the process for the first time in a long time was controlled by Democrats. In California, uh, for example, uh, that, that state had been gerrymandered to protect incumbents, uh, but it was a, it's a very Democratic state. Obama got over 50, or excuse me, over 60% uh, of the vote there. So we're looking to pick up anywhere from three to five seats at least in California. Florida, same thing. Because of this new law uh, that was passed there, the Republican legislature drew a map that gives us three new seats. We're in court right now. We're going to try to get that up to five or six new seats. Um, but even the Republicans were not able to draw a seat that protected all their uh, Republican incumbents. And then Illinois, as I said earlier, we controlled the process there for the first time in a long time. We drew a very fair map, naturally. It's very uh, compact and, and, and happens to be helpful for Democrats. Um, Republicans, as I mentioned earlier, they did the same thing to us in North Carolina. They really redrew that map. But what we lose in Georgia, North Carolina, Utah, Indiana, we're going to pick up and more uh, in the other states that I mentioned. So redistricting overall is a wash, but it's created some really important new opportunities uh, for us to pick up seats. And as I, and, and I, I just went through some of these states, but our battleground is no longer the traditional Democratic battleground for federal races, Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, states like that. We certainly have races in those states and we're competing in those states, but the bulk of our seats are gonna, are gonna come to us outside the presidential map. California, Illinois, and New York. Florida is an incredibly uh, important state for us, as I mentioned. Everybody's going to be playing in New York, uh, and we will be there as well. Uh, let's see if this will work here. Okay, let me just talk quickly about messaging. I don't want to uh, drill down too deep because people have been talking about this all day. People forget when the Republican majority was elected in November, uh, they had pretty decent numbers. They, they had about 50% favorability, which today is pretty good. Uh, back in the day, it wasn't so good, but you know, now more people think uh, you know, aliens live on Earth and Congress does a good job. So um, understanding that reality, there has been a steady decline among the Republicans, first with their government shutdown over funding for Planned Parenthood, the Ryan budget uh, that ended Medicare, the debt ceiling fight, the super committee, when they blocked the, the tax cut for the middle class. Um, the, the, the GOP has been in steady decline in terms of their job approval, and what we're seeing this translate into is a, a, is a, a sharp movement with independents. If you look at this chart here, you can see that in August of last year, Republicans led independents by 17 points. This is devastating. We can't win back the majority with numbers like these, but you can see by January, we were ahead by six. And again, this is a result of their own legislative policies. I wasn't on TV. I wasn't, we weren't doing anything yet. We will. We'll make sure people remember what happened. But the Republicans are basically digging their own grave here. Uh, and these are the kinds of movements we need to see uh, to get those 25 uh, seats. OK, so let me talk quickly about what we're doing uh, ourselves at the DCCC. Uh, we, one of the big lessons we, were, we learned last cycle uh, was that not only do we need to be ready to, to say something about the Republicans, but we need to be ready to respond to what they say about us. And a lot has been said today about this important fight that we're having over spending priorities, that we all agree we need to balance the budget, but we got to do it the right way. We're not going to do it on the backs of working families to give more tax breaks to millionaires. We've doubled our research budget at the DCCC doubled the number of staff we have working on this, and on every single race, we're drilling down to anticipate what is the Republican gonna say about our candidate and what's our response. And I wanna show you an example of this uh, from a special election we just had in Oregon. Rob Cornelis is attacking Suzanne Bonamici on taxes, 
The Associated Press reports Rob Cornelis' own business failed to pay $83,000 in taxes. The IRS even had to place a lien on Cornelis' business to collect the unpaid taxes. Despite Cornelis being worth as much as $7 million, fails to pay taxes but attacks his opponent on taxes. That's Rob Cornelis. One set of rules for himself, another for the rest of us. I'm Suzanne Bonamici and I approve this message. So as you can see, what we were able to do here is anticipate that we'd be attacked on taxes and spending, which of course we were, and we had an appropriate response to put that, to take what should be our weakness, turn it around, throw it right back at them, and make it uh, an offensive strength for us uh, in that race. This is the kind of work that we're doing in all of our targeted districts um, right now. So let me drill into uh, uh, some of those districts right now, and I'll go very quickly because this is, we have a lot of races always. This is always our challenge. Um, we currently have 17 uh, currently serving members of Congress that we are focused on defending. We call this our frontline program. Um, I won't go through each one of them. A lot of these folks had their district change as a result of redistricting. Um, in New York in particular, we just came out of the redistricting process there. Uh, Kathy Hochul, who won in a special election uh, this year, has a very has a particularly challenging race now. We, we're very convinced she can win. The polling there is very encouraging. Um, also there, Bill Owens, uh, and also Congresswoman Slaughter uh, now has a significantly more challenging race. Um, but other folks here, particularly from California, Iowa, uh, and some other states have been added to that list. So these are going to be our top priority in terms of uh, defending seats. Uh, the next is we have some great open seats that we are competing in. A lot of these were created by redistricting. Um, this is, uh, these are all members of what we call our Red to Blue program. These are our top priority uh, recruits that we are trying to, uh, uh, or rather who are challenging uh, Republicans. In this case, uh, they're, they're challenging a currently held Republican district that is open. Um, we have uh, six folks here. I won't go through each one of them, uh, but I'm sure everybody can see some. Uh, from their states, whoop, I'm trying to get this thing to go here. Um, in, in total, we have 37 uh, red to blue districts or candidates running nationwide. Uh, it's the biggest list we've ever released. We also released it two months earlier than ever before. Uh, we have really solid representation from across the country. As I mentioned, John Oseguera, uh in Nevada is on that team. Uh, and one thing I wanted to highlight, because I know we have some folks here from Illinois, we just came out of the primary there. Illinois is a prime opportunity for us, as I mentioned earlier, to pick up four new seats. Uh, Brad Harriman is running to uh, replace Congressman Costello in the 12th district, uh, but Sherry Bustos, Bill Foster, Brad Schneider, Tammy Duckworth, all outstanding candidates who really benefited from uh, their primaries. Some of them were very competitive, uh, very, very strong candidates uh, there. Uh, and then these are districts nationwide that we've put on our Red to Blue program. Uh, these are our top priorities in terms of uh, uh, supporting the candidate when they come out of a primary. These are all places where we have very competitive primaries. You can see California, uh, we have a lot uh, going on there and we'll have a, a lot of candidates coming out of that primary. In addition to this, because of redistricting, we had some new safe seats, as I mentioned, that came out of that process. We're gonna keep a close watch on them. We're not gonna take anything for granted. But these six candidates here are in a pretty good shape to come to Congress next year. Uh, and they have committed to helping other Democrats get elected and committing resources to them. Uh, Joe Kennedy, who's running to replace Barney Frank in Massachusetts' fourth district. Dina Titus, who's running uh, next to John Oseguera in Nevada, doing a terrific job helping him out. Uh, Tony Cardenas, who's on the uh, uh, Los Angeles City Council. Stephen Horsford, another candidate there in Nevada. He's actually the Senate president. Joaquin Castro uh, in Texas. And then uh, Alan Grayson, some of you may be familiar with from Florida, um, is also on that program. Again, all these folks are helping our candidates financially uh, uh, in the race. And then we have some other uh, districts here. These are folks that are emerging. They've, they've come on a little bit later than other candidates. Uh, very good districts. Actually, Raul Ruiz, who you'll see there in... Um, California 36th district. We just got a terrific poll back there. He's definitely going to put that race into play. We've also got some great candidates in the South, in Arkansas, Florida, um, Tennessee. All of these are folks that we are focused on getting into play so that we can get them on that red to blue list and make them a top priority for, uh, for Democrats this cycle. So that's where I will end it. I know I went through a lot, but again, I want to say a very big thank you to all of you for all your help, and we look forward to working with you. So thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you.